tonight on Wired. The Department of Energy orders local oil companies to unbundle their fuel prices. Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio refutes President Duterte's statement saying the Philippine government cannot allow Chinese fishers to trawl in the country's exclusive economic zone. And Michael Jackson fans remember the King of Pop as they mark the 10th year since his death. Tropical depression Dodong is about to exit the Philippine area of responsibility tonight. As of 4 p.m., Dodong is located at 755 kilometers east-northeast of Basco, Batanes. Pagasa said the weather disturbance has no direct effect in the country, but it enhances the southwest monsoon that will bring rains mostly in the western section of Luzon. Expect scattered rain showers and thunderstorms in Car, Ilocos Region, Central Luzon, Metro Manila, Calabarzon, Mimaropa, Bicol, and Visayas. The rest of the country will also experience isolated rain showers and thunderstorms. Meanwhile, Pagasa is also monitoring two low-pressure area in and out of the Philippine area of responsibility. The weather agency said they are monitoring if these weather system will develop into tropical cyclones. The effects of El Nino in the Philippines may extend until the year 2020 based on the climate forecast. Ray Pillai reports why. The Quezon City Public School Teachers Association want the local government to push a uniform class suspension policy in Metro Manila. The teachers group is an affiliate of Militant Drought is still experienced in 32 provinces in the country this month of June based on the latest assessment of the State Weather Bureau. The Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or PAGASA says most of these areas are in Mimaropa, Western Visayas and the Zamboanga Peninsula. But PAGASA forecasts that near normal rainfall will be experienced starting next month. Around 9 to 3 tropical cyclones may enter or be formed in the Philippine area of responsibility and landfalling scenarios may happen mostly during the last quarter of the year. Pagasa notes that tropical cyclones provides 50% of the country's water supply. Meanwhile, Angat Dam's water level continues to drop. This is where Metro Manila and nearby provinces source 96% of water supply from. For the past 14 years, it is only now that it is experiencing the level trend again. Nakita po natin dito na nung uh, 18 July 2010, bumaba po siya ng pinakamababa na 157.56 meters. Tapos nung 20 July 2014, nakapagtala tayo ng 162.74 meters. At sa ngayon nga po, ang level ng tubig natin ngayong 26 June ay nasa 158.4 meters. Pagasa also predicts that El Nino may still persist until August with a 70% chance but it may extend until the next quarter of next year. But the agency projects that the level of Angat Dam would start to gradually increase next month. Aabot pa ito ng July or August. Yung pagtaas ha, or doon sa operating level, hindi natin siya nakikita na biglang tataas. Except kung merong bagyo na talagang tatama, dadaan at magbubuhos ng ulan doon mismo sa Angat Dam. Kung gusto natin ano, ma-reach yung 180 meter level na ang normal operating level ng Angat Dam, ang kinakailangan po natin ay nasa 365 millimeters of rainfall. On the other hand, La Mesa Dam's water level is almost 70 meters as of this morning. This is below its normal level of 78 to 79 meters above sea level. Ang nagiging problema dito dahil sa katagalan na hindi nagamit yung, yung intake na yun, medyo maburak. So yun yung yung issue ngayon, parang concern nila kasi oras na buksan nila yon sasama yung mga buhangin pababa. So, apektado yung quality ng tubig na isusupply sa Metro Manila. La Mesa Dam is one of the water sources of Manila Water which provides water services to more than 6 million people in the east zone of Metro Manila. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City.
A teacher's group calls for the release of the uniform suspension policy for the national capital region following heavy rains that brought flash floods in some parts of Metro Manila. April Senadoza will tell us why. The Quezon City Public School Teachers Association want the local government to push a uniform class suspension policy in Metro Manila. The teachers group is an affiliate of Militant Group Alliance of Concerned Teachers or ACT Teachers. Last year, the Metro Manila Council agreed to draft the policy. But according to Metropolitan Manila Development Authority General Manager Jojo Garcia, there is no such policy yet. Some students took to social media to express their sentiments as they await class suspension. Yung mga teachers at saka mga estudyante talaga ay nag-aabang ng class suspension pero walang nangyaring class suspension. Marami dun sa mga bahagi ng particular halimbawa sa Quezon City, Malabo, Nabotas ang binaha. Pero tuloy pa rin yung klase. Ang kalagayan sa loob ng mga paaralan ay konti yung mga estudyante natin na pumasok dahil hindi kinaya na suungin yung baha. The group also hopes that barangay captains could also declare class suspensions because they are the nearest to the communities. Pwedeng magkaroon ng uniform guidelines single dun sa class suspension pero uh, bibigyan pa rin sana ng kapangyarihan yung mga barangay captains dahil sila yung mas malapit dun sa mga communities kung saan bumabaha. Based on the Department of Education's guidelines, classes are automatically suspended in areas where storm warning signals are declared. Pag-asa's weather warning at 10 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. on the next day will be the basis of class suspension. Local government units will declare class suspensions in areas where there is no storm warning signal. LGUs must announce class suspension before or at 4.30 a.m. LGUs must also declare cancellation of classes before or at 11 a.m. for afternoon classes. April Senedoza, UNTV News and Rescue. Quezon City. The government relocates over 100 informal settler families living around Estero de Abad and Estero de Magdalena in Manila City to Caloocan and Cavite. The Pasig River Rehabilitation Commission and its partner agencies aim to finish the relocation by next month. Arlene Delgado explains further. Alejandro was cleaning up debris from his daughter's trampled house when we saw him. After staying near Estero de Magdalena for almost 30 years, this time Alejandro agreed to be relocated. May okay naman, okay naman. Total may kapalit naman, may, may bahay. Tapos may bigyan ka pa ng pera. Ayos naman. Hindi namin sariling lugar. Total, alis kami. Alejandro is just one of the 270 families living around the Estero de Magdalena who will be relocated to Barangay Cabuco in Trece Martires City, Cavite until next month. We want to save them from living along the danger zones. No? Um, that's the social impact that we want to achieve here. No? Hindi naman sa gusto ng paalisin lang just because gusto lang namin sila mawala dito. But we really want to protect them as well. Meanwhile, 51 more families living near Estero de San Antonio de Abad were relocated to Camarín, Caloocan earlier today. Some are happy, but some are worried. Hindi nga raw po maayos yung pinagbagsaan nila, lalo na po yung CR. Ilagay nila kami sa maayos kasi alam nila nandito kami sa mapanganib na lugar. Pero yung babagsaan din namin, wala rin naman pala sa ayos. Maninibago kami sa mga, sa mga kapaligiran, sa mga tao makakasalamuan namin, di ba? Tsaka kung ano magiging buhay namin doon. Hindi siya perfect. Hindi naman siya yung tipong binili natin sa isang private de developer talaga. Siguro lang talaga baka nadat na nila or may mga nakita sila mga areas or mga units na hindi pa complete. Pero alam ko ongoing pa siya eh. So ang mahalaga naman dito is mas safer na yung lugar nila as compared here. The Pasig River Rehabilitation Commission or PRRC added it is in the hands of the local government unit to ensure that no one will go back to the Esteros or else they will face sanctions. For assistance, the Department of Interior and Local Government, or DILG, will provide an interim shelter fund worth 18,000 pesos to each family. The relocation is part of the rehabilitation of Pasig River, which contributes greatly to the condition of the water of Manila Bay. The next steps for the PRRC are the relocation of other informal settler families near other waterways and the reclamation of the three-meter easement zones at other esteros. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue Manila.
The Department of Energy has ordered oil companies to unbundle the price of oil products in the Philippines, but oil firms reject the order. Find out why as Mon Hoxon reports. Fuel unbundling. This is the Department of Energy or DOE's order to oil companies to divulge how they set prices of fuel in the Philippines. Through fuel unbundling, the public will know how much oil firms spend for import costs, freight costs, taxes, refining costs, storage costs, and even the company's profit margin. This will answer the questions of many as to why oil prices vary in gasoline stations or is fuel really overpriced. However, recently, a group of oil firms, the Philippine Institute of Petroleum Incorporated or PIP, has filed a petition for a temporary restraining order or TRO for the fuel unbundling order. The PIP is composed of Petron Corporation, Pilipinas Shell Petroleum Corporation, Chevron Philippines Incorporated, PTT Philippines, Total Philippines Corporation, and Isla LPG Corporation. But why do oil companies reject the Energy Department's order? Shell, one of the biggest oil companies, has answered the question saying that oil bundling may lead the industry back to being regulated again. Currently, the oil deregulation law is in effect. This means that the government must not intervene or meddle on how oil companies set their prices. Meron po kasi isang express provision ang batas ng Order Regulation Law Section 15 na talaga nagbibigay ng karapatan at, at ng otoridad sa Secretary of Energy na humingi ng almost kahit anong impormasyon mula sa oil companies. At uh, sa tingin po namin, ginawa ito, ito po ang disenyo ng batas para makapagbigay po ng mga rekomendasyon ang Department of Energy sa Kongreso ukol sa pagpapago, pag-aamenda ng ating mga batas regarding oil prices. Even Vic Dimagiba of Consumer Rights Group Laban Consumer agrees with the DOE. For Dimagiba, it is the right of the public to know how oil companies set their prices. He asserts the group is skeptic about the objection of oil companies to the unbundling order. Publicly listed company naman ng karamihan eh. So, wala naman silang dapat itago eh. Nire-report din nila yung kanilang profit sa SEC at sa stock exchange. Huwag naman sana magkatoto na ang presyo ng produktong petrolyo ay eh, masasabi natin overpriced, quote ang quote, o mataas pa sa dapat lamang na ibenta sa mga consumers. Yun po siguro ang kanilang gustong alagaan. Suspecha lang po yan. The DOE said they will pursue the implementation of the order which takes effect on July 2, as long as there's no TRO issued by the court. Come July 2, the court will hear the oil company's petition to stop the enforcement of the Energy Department's fuel price unbundling circular. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The whistleblowers in the controversial PhilHealth ghost dialysis scam has asked the court to defer their impending transfer to Quezon City Jail. In a motion filed before the Quezon City Regional Trial Court Branch 219, Edwin Roberto and Lizelle Santos pleaded to remain under the National Bureau of Investigation or NBI's custody. Justice Secretary Minardo Guevara confirms the two are now under the agency's provisional witness protection program for 90 days pending investigation as well as the preliminary investigation of seven other respondents. The whistleblower's legal counsel, attorney Hari Roque, says the witness's impending transfer is unfair. So kahapon, nabulabog kami kasi nga gusto nilang ilipat sa city jail yung mga whistleblowers. At sabi namin, hindi ata makatulungan yan. Dahil kung hindi dahil sa kanilang dalawa, hindi natin malalaman yung, yung ganong katinding corruption dyan. Good evening, uh, ruling party Partido Democratico Pilipino Lakas ng Bayan expresses their support for the House Speakership bid of Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco, but a member of the party is disappointed. Nel Maribohok tells us why.
Partido Democratico Pilipino Lakas ng Bainor PDP Laban Executive Vice President Pampanga Representative Don Gonzalez reveals that out of the ruling party's 84 members, 60 have signed the manifesto of support to Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco in the House Speakership race. Even some members of some parties like the Nationalista and Liberal parties also sign a separate manifesto. According to Gonzalez, the number of support they have gathered is enough for Velasco to secure the House Speaker seat. Sa meeting namin sa different parties, uh, more or less nasa 200 na po, 200 members na, na pipirma at susuporta kay Congressman Lord Velasco. Gonzalez also assures there is no vote buying among the party members regarding the speakership race. He adds they have agreed there will be no term sharing and Velasco will serve the full three-year term. It was Senator Manny Pacquiao who announced this morning that Velasco is PDP Laban's candidate in the speakership race in the House of Representatives of the coming 18th Congress. Maganda yung uh, bata yung uh, speaker natin and then uh, maasahan din para sa uh, kapakanan ng for the welfare of the Filipino people uh, na itong last uh, three years ng uh, Pangulo. Velasco expresses gratitude for his co-lawmaker support. He assures that if elected as House Speaker, he will remain a consultative and listening leader to lawmakers regardless of their political colors. However, despite much amount of support, PDP Laban member Albay Representative Joey Salceda has expressed disappointments over the said announcement. The Solon revealed there had been no consultation before the release of such decision of support to Velasco. Salceda believes there are other party members who will vote another contender for House Speakership. It's the President's choice to make, not for Manny Pacquiao. Meanwhile, the party list coalitions say they have no decision yet on who to support in the upcoming opening of Congress in July. I would like to clarify that the party list has never decided uh, to support Lord Alan Velasco. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Makabayan Bloc has formally announced the candidacy of Bayan Muna Representative Carlos Zarate as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Zarate is the sixth congressman to express interest in becoming the next House Speaker in the 18th Congress. According to outgoing ACT Teachers Party List Representative Antonio Tino, Congress needs a leader that will prioritize the interest of the people and not the interest of other countries. No? Kailangan ng speaker na ipaglalaban ang karapatan ng mga magagawa, magsasaka, kababaihan, kamataan, luman, at iba pa. Kailangan natin ng speaker na tunay na uh, lalabanan ang korupsyon no? at titindig para sa human rights. Other lawmakers who are also vying for the position are Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco, incoming Tagig 1st District Representative Alan Peter Cayetano, Pampanga 3rd District Representative Aurelio Gonzalez, and Leyte 1st District Representative Martin Romualdez. In other news, the speakership race in the House of Representatives continues as election of new House leaders nears. Grace Kassin tells us why. The race for the House Speakership started during the campaign for the May 2019 elections. This was especially when Hugpong ng Pagbabago Chairperson Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte Carpio called Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco and, Re and later Representative-elect Martina Romualdez House Speaker in some of their campaigns in provinces. Well, lahat ng... Uh, mga congressmen na supportive uh, sa administration ni President Duterte and who expressed interest in uh, becoming speaker, uh, I support them. Yes. So, wala ay uh, choice of one but uh, ang ginatanaw na mo is kung kinsa ang uh, supporter ni uh, President Duterte because uh, we need uh, the House of Representatives uh, to move uh, towards the direction of uh, the president. After the May 13 elections, five congressmen announced their desire to be the next House Speaker. They are Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco, Leyte Congressman-elect Martin Romualdez, Taguig City Representative-elect Alan Peter Cayetano, 
Davao City Representative Pantalon Alvarez and Pampanga Representative Aurelia Gonzalez Jr. On June 5, Belasco was seen with Mayor Sara in Singapore. A post showing a video of the two says it was a late celebration of Davao City Mayor's birthday. On the other hand, Romualdez was visible in some President Rodrigo Duterte events. He also met with the presidential children and was even present during their oath-taking with the president. Velasco, Romualdez, and Caetano met with the chief executive in Japan during his official trip. They wanted the president to choose among them but he refused. Last week, Davao City Representative-elect Paulo Duterte hosted a dinner for President Duterte and some congressmen. Velasco was also present. On the president's official trip in Thailand during the weekend, Velasco and Caetano joined him. On Monday, the three attended Hugpong Nang Pagbabago's Thanksgiving party. They were seen talking with the president. As the election of the new House Speaker nears, the Speaker aspirants are also busy campaigning to get the votes of their colleagues. According to political analyst Edmund Tayo, there is nothing wrong seeing them with the president and his children. It's also a way of showing to the public, oh, uh, uh, tawag dito, uh, ako ang uh, kaalyato o kapanalit ng Pangulo o ng administrasyon. Ganun, ginagawa nila yun kasi uh, kasama yun sa pangangampanya. He adds the speakership race is not chaotic because there are five contenders. Yun nga rin ang eksplanasyon ng Pangulo kung bakit hindi siya mag i kasi halos lahat sila ay kaalyato ng Pangulo. So, hindi ibig sabihin na dahil uh, walang inendorso ay eh, magiging magulo. Mag Magsesettle down yan kapag ka meron na talagang napili ang mga membro ng Kongreso. The lower house will elect their next speaker on July 22 before the President Duterte's fourth State of the Nation address. Grace Kasin, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. Department of National Defense, or DND, is still studying the lifting of martial law in Mindanao. Marisol Montaño will tell us why. The Department of National Defense, or DND, regularly conducts consultations with the Armed Forces of the Philippines and Philippine National Police in relation to the lifting of martial law in Mindanao. This is after Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte Carpio requested to exempt her city from martial law because the peace and order situation in the area is well enforced. According to defense spokesperson Arsenio Andono, even before the presidential daughter made her request, they are aware that there are parts of Mindanao which are peaceful and without threat. In fact, Andodon added, they want to recommend to the president to finally lift the martial law as soon as possible. The implementation of the martial law in Mindanao will be finished in December this year after it has been extended three times since 2017 after the Marawi siege. For the 10th Infantry Division of Philippine Army in Davao City, they understand the mayor's request, but the lifting of martial law should undergo a process. So we value the wisdom and uh, first-hand knowledge of our local executive of the prevailing security environment in the respective communities and we always take uh, their observations and recommendations into consideration. The lifting of martial law in Mindanao is constantly being evaluated by the Defense Department. And the Meanwhile, the Department of the Interior and Local Government or DILG in Davao region is in support of the mayor saying martial law affects investments in the city. That is a very good idea. Okay, one of the problems uh, yeah, to Bansa Davao is the apprehension of the investors. Okay, we are still under martial law, so probably naim you uneasiness. Though, kitang mga nagkuyo dere, may unta nga maramagoy martial law. Marisol Montano, you want TV News and Rescue Davao City. For President Rodrigo Duterte, the Philippine exclusive economic zone is open to Chinese fishermen. But Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio says allowing China to fish within the zone is against the Constitution. Rosalie Cos tells us why. The 22 fishermen who were victims of a maritime incident when a Chinese vessel rammed their fishing boat near the Reed Bank have asked the government to prevent China from fishing in our Exclusive Economic Zone or EEZ. An EEZ pertains to the Z zone within the 200 nautical miles from the shore of the Philippines, in which Filipinos have the exclusive and special rights 
regarding the exploration and use of marine resources and other economic activities. This includes the Reed or Recto Bank. But when President Rodrigo Duterte was asked about this, So should we prevent China from fishing in our EEZ? I don't think that China would do that. Okay. Why? Because we're friends. Okay, sir. And uh, they're of the same view that that, that should not uh, result in any bloody confrontation. So, yeah. The palace has also explained. Kasi friends nga daw eh. Kung friends na magbibigayan kayo. But according to Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio, the Philippine government cannot allow Chinese fishermen to fish in the Philippine EEZ in the West Philippine Sea because this violates the Constitution. The Armed Forces of the Philippines, he says, is specifically tasked by the Constitution to be the protector of the people and to secure the sovereignty of the state and the integrity of the national territory. The President, as the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, has the constitutional duty to direct the Armed Forces to protect the nation's maritime wealth in its exclusive economic zone. According to Senator Panfilo Lacson, Article 12, Section 2, Paragraph 2 of the Philippine Constitution does not mention the word friends. It says the state shall protect the nation's marine wealth in its archipelagic waters, territorial sea, and exclusive economic zone and reserve its use and enjoyment exclusively to Filipino citizens. Meanwhile, for maritime law expert Professor Jay Batong Bakal, the government's move shows how the Philippines surrenders and renounces its victory when the Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2016 favored the Philippines over China on the disputed territories in the West Philippine Sea. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. Liberal Party President Senator Francis Pangilinan believes that President Rodrigo Duterte's statement of allowing a Chinese fishing in the Exclusive Economic Zone or EEZ of the country is in violation of the Constitution. According to the Senator, Recto Bank is part of the Philippines EEZ and allowing foreigners to fish there violates our Constitution. On the other hand, some senators do not see any impeachable offense with the statement of the president. According to Senator Panfilo Lacson, there is no concrete act on the president's part that could be considered violative of the Constitution. Instead, it was simply a media statement which is not sufficient to impeach him. This is also the opinion of Senate President Vicente Soto III. Senator Soto says that if some people think there is indeed a betrayal of public trust, they are welcome to file a case. Wish 107.5 extends the auditions for Wish Covery Season 3. Mirasol Abogadil will tell us why. Due to insistent public demand, Wish 107.5 extends the online edition for Wish Covery Originals, the third season of the biggest online singing competition in the country. It was set to conclude on June 30, but the FM station has decided to protract the process of searching for new talented singer-songwriters. And not only that, Wish 107.5 is also geared up to hold on-ground auditions for those who wish to join the contest but are not able to send their audition videos online. The one-of-a-kind Wish Bus will visit key cities in Visayas and Mindanao for the auditions, including Cebu, Iloilo, Bacolod, Davao, Butuan, and Cagayan de Oro starting July 2. For a complete list of audition dates and venues, just visit Wish 1075's website and social media accounts. On-ground auditionees is required to bring one valid ID, their original song's lyrics in word format, and a minus one file of their composition in MP3 format. Aspirants who want to perform their songs using their own musical instruments are also welcome to audition on board the Wish Bus. Wish Covery Originals is open to Filipino soloists, duos or groups and bands who are not only talented singers but also brilliant songwriters. Mirasol Abugadil, UNTV News and Rescue. Welcome back. 
to Y News. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the bilateral relations between the Philippines and Singapore. And as part of the celebration, the Lion City holds a food festival which includes the Filipino cuisine. Mary Jo Maleviado will tell us why. Lechon belly, pork barbecue, oxtail kare kare, seafood sinigang, and fish ceviche. These are just some of the Filipino dishes featured at the food festival held at Mandarin Orchards, Singapore, prepared by Filipino chef Michelle Adrellana. The occasion is part of the 50th anniversary celebration of the bilateral relations between the Philippines and Singapore. Beef sisig. Beef sisig because it's made with oxtail. So since um, hindi siya pork, diba? so kumukuha ko ng ang show's part niya ron sa oxtail. Yung taba na oxtail, there's gelatinous, tas merong brisket, merong uh, top plate, and then my beef cheeks for that extra um, yung lambot. And then I also have oxtail kare kare. And then we also have the fish mayonesa. And then we have crab fat rice. And then of course the uh, adobo paella with foie gras. So it's umami, it's savory, it's sour, it's rich. Alam mo naman ang gusong Pinoy, basta meron ka nun. Then aligri rice. Then we also have the sinigang, seafood sinigang with, uh, with crab fat. And a whole lot more. The Lion City is the third leg of Chef Adriliana's Asian tour. The lady chef says her goal is to place the Filipino cuisine on the culinary map. Very distinct is umami, savory, and sour. Tsaka lahat may sausawan, di ba? <laughs> Kahit medyo minsan, medyo maalat na, pero may sausawan pa din. Merong patis, merong suka. So, I think Filipino food is defined by sausawan. Meanwhile, for Philippine ambassador to Singapore, Joseph Del Mariap, the Filipino cuisine can compete with other international foods. Yes, uh, we've been trying to introduce Filipino cuisine dito sa Singapore. Singapore naman is a uh, hub, maraming different types of cuisine available here. So Filipino cuisine is something that we want to add to that mix. A lot of people, a lot of Singaporeans will be able to try Filipino food and enjoy it. And for entertainment, internationally acclaimed Philippine magical singers were also featured on the occasion. Na natutuwa naman kami at na naging bahagi kami ng celebration. And we are actually on a, on a tour of some ASEAN countries. Uh, the real intention was to, to share some of our culture through music, sa mga, not only to Filipinos in those countries, but also to the citizens of those countries. Filipinos here in Singapore look forward to more events prepared by the Philippine Embassy in celebrating the golden friendship of the two countries. Mary Jo Malariado, Yantini News and Rescue, Singapore. Filipinos may lack preparation for medical needs, but they remain happy about their health according to a study. Aiko Miguel will tell us why. Filipinos feel good about their health and well-being. This is a result of a Field Care Wellness Index study based on interviews with 1,200 Filipinos aged 21 to 55 from across the country. According to Dr. Fernando Paragas, the lead researcher of Field Care Wellness Index, a person may appear happy but is actually feeling unwell inside. Very optimistic kasi tayo, di ba? Very positive tayo uh, bilang tao. Kaya ganyan, just sabihin mo, okay ako. Alam mo, yung sa physical, hindi kabihin nila, maganda yung kanilang height weight ratio para maganda yung pangangatawan. Pero, base din sa ibang sagot, nalalaman mong merong nararamdaman yan. Marami kasing sakit na ngayon na hindi naman nakikita pang labas. Sa so, alam mo, diabetes, pwede ka namang payat, may diabetes ka. Na hypertension ka, pwede kang payat. Filipinos also fear of undergoing medical checkups and of being diagnosed with an illness because this will result in allotting their income for medication. This is why Filipinos often neglect their medical situation. Isang buwang sweldo yung nagagasos sa isang taon para lang ma ma makapagpa-hospital ng, ng kasambahay, ng kasama sa bahay. So malaking bahagi yun ng ating budget. Majority of the respondents, especially the younger ones, believe that it is better to travel and go on a vacation to stay away from the stressful day-to-day -day life. Sa feeling mo, say mamamasyal ako kasi nga toxic ang ating kabuhayan, hindi ako magkakasakit. Pero pag nagkasakit ka dahil nagasas mo sa pagbabiyahe, wala ka nang pangbayad sa ospital. It also appears on the study that only 15% of the respondents are able to settle their bills using health insurance. Former Health Secretary Enrique Ona advises Filipinos to secure health insurance which is beneficial in times of emergency. That you have to cover yourself 
with either a uh, an SMO or a, a private health insurance to cover yung tinatawag nating catastrophic diseases. But that is the the as I said the challenge of a growing country like the Philippines. Health is wealth. Experts say investing on health must be top priority because it is still happier to live with a healthy body free from pain caused by illnesses. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. And for the news abroad, the House of Representatives voted to approve an emergency border aid bill in aid for the growing crisis at the U.S. southern border, a vote that followed Democratic infighting over the package and a White House veto threat. Kaf Dumaraos tells us why. The U.S. House of Representatives on Tuesday approved a $4.5 billion aid package to address the migrant surge along the U.S.-Mexico border, including new standards for migrants in custody, following reports of poor conditions facing young children at overcrowded facilities. This situation is child abuse. It is an atrocity that violates every value we have, not only as Americans, but as moral beings. The Democratic-led House voted 230 to 195, mostly along party lines, to pass the measure, but its future is uncertain. The Republican-run Senate is working on its own version of the bill, and Republican President Donald Trump has vowed to veto the House legislation, with White House officials saying it would hamstring the administration's border enforcement efforts. Trump on May 1st requested the aid for programs that house, feed, transport, and oversee record numbers of Central American families seeking asylum in the United States and straining capacity at migrant shelters and border cities. I'm very concerned. Uh, it's in much better shape than it ever was. A lot of these young children come from places that you don't even want to know about, the way they've lived, the way they've been, uh, the way that the poverty that they grew up in. But uh, with that, if we can get this bill signed, we'll be able to do it. We have, you know, the, the Democrats don't want to sign anything. And now I think they're going to probably sign this from what I understand. It's, I call it humanitarian aid. This isn't even about border. Attorneys raised alarms last week after finding more than 300 migrant children in an overcrowded Texas border patrol station where they said some had been held for weeks in squalid conditions without adequate food and water. Amid the ensuing outcry, the acting commissioner of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency, John Sanders, resigned effective July 5. Democrats emphasized on Tuesday that while they were approving the border aid to address the humanitarian crisis, they were not ratifying the administration's attempt to restrict and discourage immigration, which Trump has made a central focus of his presidency. Got Numara Osu in TV News and Rescue. San Francisco has become the first U.S. city to ban e-cigarette sales until their health effects are clearer. Sunny Koss will tell us why. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors approved the ordinance on Tuesday banning the sale and distribution of e-cigarettes until they have approval from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Juul, which is based in San Francisco, has grown to be a dominant e-cigarette maker in the United States, has been at the center of the debate. As its sales soared over the last two years, so did its popularity among teenagers. Federal data last year showed a 78% increase in e-cigarette use among U.S. high schoolers, and state and local lawmakers have been grappling with how to regulate Juul and other similar products. I think um, banning it is um, good because maybe because kids smoke them a lot. You know? I go back to smoking cigarettes full time or go across the bay, go somewhere else. No big deal. I mean. E-cigarettes have existed in a regulatory gray area for years. Its makers originally faced a 2018 deadline to submit applications to the FDA to sell products, but the deadline was pushed back to 2022. Amid the surge in teenage use, the FDA in March moved up the deadline to 2021. A separate court case from anti-tobacco groups may force the FDA to set an earlier deadline. San Francisco Supervisor Shaman Walton said he has been constantly hearing from young people about e-cigarettes and how readily available they are in schools, the fact that they're easily hidden from educators. Uh, we have irresponsible companies like Juul that target our young people, and Juul is headquartered in my district, and so uh, the community is highly upset. 
Jules said the move would drive smokers back to cigarettes and create a thriving black market. E-cigarettes are generally thought to be safer than traditional cigarettes, which kill up to half of all lifetime users, according to the World Health Organization. But the long-term health effects of the nicotine devices remain largely unknown. Sonica's UN TV News and Rescue, USA. In Malaysia, Malaysian authorities said on Wednesday they had seized more than 5,000 smuggled terrapins at Kuala Lumpur Airport last week. Two Indian nationals were traveling with 5,255 red-eared sliders, a semi-aquatic species of turtle, in baskets within their luggage. The total value of the whole was over $12,700. The two men, who were arrived from China's northwestern city of Guangzhou, last Thursday had been detained and are expected to be charged, authorities said. In the United Kingdom, a man with paranoid schizophrenia who pushed a 91-year-old passenger onto the tracks at a busy London underground train station was sentenced to life imprisonment on Monday after earlier being found guilty of two counts of attempted murder. Security camera footage showed Crosley attempted to push a 23-year-old man onto the tracks unsuccessfully at Tottenham Court Road Station in central London on April 27 last year. Crossley then traveled a couple of stops to Marble Arc Station. There, he shoved an elderly man who suffered multiple pelvis fractures and a severe cut as he plunged headfirst onto the tracks. Paul Crossley underwent months of psychiatric assessment before he was sentenced by a judge to a hospital order until he is deemed fit for prison, where he will spend a minimum of 12 years. Ferdi Petalio, UNTV News and Rescue. A rescue dog from Mexico that has participated in dozens of missions during some of the world's most destructive natural disasters has officially retired. Nina Armilio will tell us why. Frida, the Navy rescue dog, who emerged as a source of inspiration and pride after Mexico's devastating September 2017 earthquake, received a formal farewell from naval officials at a retirement ceremony on Monday. Known for her custom-made doggy goggles and boots, the Yellow Labrador became a social media star after her search and rescue efforts in Mexico City in the aftermath of the quake. The Navy has credited Frida with saving 12 people's lives and locating more than 40 bodies. Frida, como marino naval, Frida, as a Navy sailor, you have elevated the name of our institution. You have fulfilled your mission with honor. You have united the heart of Mexico, fair winds and following seas to our dear Frida. During her career, the beloved K-9 also traveled to Haiti in 2010 and Ecuador in 2016 to assist in rescue efforts after earthquakes devastated the two countries. Frida and her trainer Israel Arauz were commemorated with a statue that was unveiled in the Parque Ecológico in Puebla. Now aged 10, her handlers have hung up her famous mask and boots and presented her with a chew toy for the next chapter of her life. Plans for her retirement have yet to be confirmed, but it's believed Frida may move to the countryside and help to train the next generation of search and rescue dogs. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this June 26, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Maganda yung uh, bata yung uh, speaker natin and then uh, maasahan din para sa uh, kapakanan ng for the welfare of the Filipino people uh, na itong last uh, three years ng uh, Pangulo. Kailangan ng speaker na ipaglalaban ang karapatan ng mga magagawa, magsasaka, kababaihan, kabataan, luma, iba pa. Kailangan natin ng speaker na tunay na uh, lalabanan ang corruption. 
no, at titindig para sa human rights. Na rin ang eksplanasyon ng Pangulo kung bakit hindi siya mag-iindorso kasi halos lahat sila ay kaalyado ng Pangulo. So hindi ibig sabihin na dahil uh, walang inindorso ay eh, magiging magulo. Mag magsesettle down yan kapag ka meron na talagang napili ang mga membro ng kongreso. Sa feeling mo, kasi mamamasyal ako kasi nga toxic ang ating kabuhayan, hindi ako magkakasakit. Pero pag nagkasakit ka dahil nagasas mo sa pag-ubiyahe, wala ka ng pangbayad sa ospital.